call. Commissioner Molis. Here. Commissioner Eight. Dixon. Chair Kelly. Yep. I do that. <laughs> <laughs> He's a full service chair. No? Now you know who's in charge. <clears throat> yes. I, now I understand. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's start over. Start over. <laughs> Chair Kelly. Here. Commissioner Dixon. Here. Commissioner Molis. Still here. <laughs> Commissioner Wilhoyt. Here. Okay, what do I do next now? <laughs> I, I wanted to hear you ask if you were here. That was going to be interesting. <laughs> All right, um, Commissioner reports. Um, it was an interesting exercise for me to uh, go through my schedule and see the things that I've been doing since the last meeting, which have kind of stepped up their activity a bit. Um, let's see, I met with uh, Jeff McDonald from the Daily Journal of Commerce. Uh, he did an interview and a profile on me. Um, I had lunch with Ed McNamara as he was saying goodbye. Um, Attended a cocktail reception honoring Scott Andrews, former chair. Um, had lunch with uh, Howard Shapiro, who's on the Planning Commission. Um, had a meeting with Greg Ness regarding the armory loans. Uh, had a meeting with Terry Brandt from the Albina Opportunities Corporation, talking about how PDC and, and they might work together. Um, I went on a tour of uh, a PDC staff-led tour um, we visited four sites, Southeast Works uh, offices in Lentz in the Jade District, um, the Division Midway uh, NPI, and the Rosewood Initiative, which was all a really educational experience for me, and I think I learned a lot and uh, was, uh, you know, I went away enthusiastic about what we're doing out in East Portland. Had a meeting with uh, Saurabh Vagasi, I would think I've got his name pronounced right, from Zebu Design about a business uh, that he's thinking about developing. And I did my first check-in with the mayor's office meeting. And then last Thursday, we had our first meeting of the uh, economic development uh, strategy planning sessions. So, been busy. Commissioner Mollis. Thank you. I was just scrolling through my calendar trying to remember what I've been doing the last couple months and found a couple things. Uh, about a month and a half ago, I attended the uh, ribbon cutting at the new uh, uh, Collaborative Life Sciences building down in the south waterfront area that uh, we provided some funds for. It's a beautiful building. Uh, I got to take a tour of that. Um, attended uh, Congressman Earl Blumenauer's uh, infrastructure rebuild and renew um, meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago at Portland State University. And then uh, probably about a month ago, I had a meeting with uh, PSU President Jim Beeble and some of his staff about um, uh, the building and uh, remodel needs that they need on their campus and what they're going to be trying to go for in the 2015 legislature and also discuss the uh, education district deal that we reached between this board and, and the mayor's office and uh, Portland State. So been a busy couple months. Summer's disappearing too fast. Thank you. Commissioner Dixon. Uh, I have nothing to report. I've just been working crazy, and so <laughs> I haven't had the time to attend as many of our PDC functions, but I see that we're in good hands here. Commissioner <laughs> <laughs> Willard. I see, unlike your schedule, mine was a little different review. Uh, I looked back, and I went to Austin, Texas, Boise, Idaho, San Antonio, Texas, Phoenix, Midville, Idaho, and Kauai, Hawaii. And that, of course, was for vacation. So my report is I'm feeling very relaxed, rested and relaxed and ready to go to work. <laughs> None of it had anything to do with PDC. <laughs> Thank you for an excellent report. <laughs> Executive Director Quinton. Thank you, uh, Chair Kelly, and, and welcome to the to the chair's seat. This is your first meeting, and good morning, commissioners. Um, yeah, even though it has been, uh, it's the middle of summer, it has been a, a busy time. Uh, it's been about six weeks since our, since our last board meeting, and in particular, we had right in the kind of third week, the second and third week of July, we had a, we had a series of, of events that, that I, th I know that here at PDC, we were Quite excited about and proud and proud of of that work, and so it started with the the, the reopening of, of Dawson Park. A PDC 
um, invested over $2 million in the renovations to Dawson Park. I know we've reported to the, to the board many times on, on that project, and we'll come back again to, to report on, on the, the contracting results. If you recall, you, you approved an alternative method for, for contracting uh, for that project to, to help us increase the participation of minority contractors and, 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 uh, and minority and women uh, uh, workers on the, on the project. And so we, we, you know, our, our commitment to you is to come back and talk about how that process worked. But just if you've been to the park, if you were at the grand opening or if you've been there since then, and I have the pleasure of going by it every day, it's really a spectacular park. And, and uh, I don't know how many people have come up to me and, and just out of the blue say, have you seen Dawson Park? It's just fantastic. And so, uh, so we're, we're really happy. And, and the event itself was, it was packed. Uh, so it's, it's just a special moment when, when you, know, you, you, you put a lot of time and money into a project and you see it come out that way. And, and if, truly, if you haven't been in Dawson Park since we opened it, I encourage everybody to go. That same week, two days later, we, <clears throat> we got to go to, um, to Swan Island and, and they had the groundbreaking for, for the Dynamo Trucks North America new headquarters building. The, the mayor and the governor uh, were there to, um, to, to help kick that off. Uh, once again, uh, you know, PDC, the state, the port are doing quite a bit to make that project happen. We're very excited about the impact of that and, and um, we're really impressed with how Daimler is, is, is making a commitment to the city in, 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 in many ways, not just the investment of their dollars, but they're, they're going to build a spectacular new facility, they're going to they're build out the greenway, they're, they're, they're really pushing their involvement in local schools. So, um, so an impressive, impressive day in that, and we'll look forward to watch that building um, come out of the ground. And then a couple days later, we uh, had the chance to go to Zenger Farms, where they had the groundbreaking for their new urban grange, which uh, PDC uh, has $300,000 grant in that. Uh, we've to date, we've I think we've invested about eight hundred thousand dollars in Zenger Farm. The 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 farm itself is owned by this. The land is owned by the city, uh, and it's a pretty special place for East Portland. Um, Zenger Farm, I think many of you know, sponsors the international farmers market that happens in Lens Town Center. That's that's a uh, one of these kind of anchor events for the, for the town center uh, during our warm weather months. But the Urban Grange will be a, a new facility that that greatly expands their uh, ability to, to run programs there. So I was, I was um, had the opportunity to join Commissioner Fish and others in, um, in that event. So, you know, in a span of, of less than a week, we got to see the range of everything that PDC does. And so it's, like I said, it was very gratifying uh, for PDC staff to, uh, to participate in that. On an entirely different note, but equally gratifying, if you saw yesterday, we, we um, had a, the, um, results of an audit by the city auditor's office released. And this audit was on our human resources and payroll practices. So it's, it's about, uh, I know this is exciting stuff here, um, uh, but, but it was both how we manage payroll, you know, from an accounting perspective, but also our job classifications and, and, and how they fit within, within the market. And once again, they, the city auditor doesn't like to issue, you know, you know anything that's positive about, about us. But uh, uh, we left them no choice. The, the, the headline was uh, human resources and payroll practices functioning effectively. That's a real attention grabber. But anyway, that's, you know, for us, that's, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's a victory to, uh, to have the city auditor come in and, and take a look around. And, and they really don't have a scope when they come in and look at our stuff. They really have the latitude to go wherever they want. And they came back with a, with a pretty positive report. So, so this was a combination of them looking at our kind of our accounting financial practices, that's, that's Faye Brown's team, um, as well as our HR practices. And we've gone through a lot of, uh, through our reorg, we've gone through a lot of um, updating to our job classifications and those kind of things. And so between Faye and her team and Jeff Fish and the HR team, um, uh, we, uh, uh, we did, did a great job. And, and I make fun, the city auditor, uh, they're really a partner of ours, that's their job. Their job isn't to come in and pat us on the back, their job is to come in and and, and, and find you know, what, what isn't working so that we can take corrective action. So I, we do appreciate the auditor's office coming in and, 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 uh, and helping keep us on our toes. And I think we're meeting, a couple of us are meeting with the auditor after this meeting as well, which we do on, on a regular basis. Um, 
we, uh, we're in the midst of our Startup PDX Challenge right now. This, this is the second one. As you know, the, the goal of this one was to really promote what we would refer to as inclusive entrepreneurship so to see if we could expand the pool of entrepreneurs of color, of, of women entrepreneurs, and the application period closed a while back, and we had, we had about 135 applications, very diverse pool of applicants. I think 70% of the, of the applicants were, were companies founded, or at least one founder was a woman, and I think over half of the companies, we had at least one founder who was a person of color or a veteran or, or someone with, with a disability. So, so we definitely, from an outreach perspective, uh, we, we accomplished our objective there. We are down to 19 finalists. Um, and once again, I think they're, they all come from, uh, it's a pool of companies that either have a woman founder or founder of color or a veteran or, or someone with, um, with a disability. We will take the, the, uh, the 19 finalists and announce six winners uh, after Labor Day, and then we have four other awards. We call them Merit Awards, so that we have basically 10 winners. But what we just did was we went through a public vote. We put it out. We announced it to the public. Here are the 19 companies. People could go online. They could read about the companies and, and vote. And the vote doesn't determine who, get, who are the six winners, but it does, it does give us some feedback on the companies. And it also, at least one, one of those companies will be a merit winner. And so we had a great turnout for the vote. My, my, uh, well, there was one company called Science Girls uh, that, is, as you can tell, it promotes, it promotes kind of educational experiences for girls around science. And my daughter heard about it. And my daughter went online and voted. She's 11. So, um, so I, I think we're reaching out we're, we're to, uh, to a pretty wide audience. Um, <clears throat> uh, over the past month, we've begun to experiment with some podcasts at the uh, as a way of kind of expanding our communication tools. So I had the, the uh, pleasure of doing two podcasts in, uh, over the past month with one with Michael Bush, who's a well-known uh, small business expert entrepreneur from the Bay Area. He came and spoke last year at our, at our uh, Northeast um, Economic Development Summit. And so uh, he and I talked a lot about inclusive entrepreneurship. And then uh, Dina Piro, who uh, she's based here. She runs a program called iUrban Teen which is a program that's uh, designed to expose um, primarily teenage boys of color to, uh, to STEM careers. And so she helps give them experiences that will encourage them to, to maybe, when they to go to college and, and, and pursue engineering and other um, like computer science and other STEM careers. So once again, this is all part of this, this broader theme of us uh, trying to promote try a more inclusive uh, pool of entrepreneurs and an inclusive technology um, sector. You may have seen that uh, in the news that the Portland metro area once again continues to outperform much of the country in terms of job growth. This latest, um, these latest statistics show that over the past 12 months, uh, Portland had the eighth fastest growing metro area in, in the region, I mean, excuse me, in the United States, and we had faster growth than Seattle and San Francisco. Uh, the cities that were that there were the metro areas that were above Portland were areas primarily in the South and Texas, so very different kind of economic con conditions there. So we feel like relative to our competitors, we're we're doing quite well. And what's interesting about our job growth, it's this it's the fastest period of job growth in the past nine years, and the second and only the second time in the past twenty years that we've had over three percent job growth over a twelve month period. So. So we are actually we are truly in a period of extraordinary job growth um, historically for for the Portland region, and um, just tying it back to the previous topic, the the challenge for us isn't how do we grow grow jobs right now. The challenge for us is to figure out how we grow jobs that benefit people people of all skill levels, people in all parts of the city, people of all of all colors. It's it's uh, I think we have the luxury now of beginning to try and really tackle that. That problem. It's not about. It's not about where the jobs are going to come from. Um, just a couple of events to to highlight that that I participated in. Um, we had the the National Newspaper Publishers Association convention at the end of June, right after our last board meeting. That's 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 really the convention of of um, black publishers, um, and so we're quite honored that they chose Portland. Uh, we owe a lot of that to, to Bernie Foster from the Scanner. He he brought the group here, and they gave us an award. Uh, PDC for its for for its leadership on, um, on on a lot of a lot of the issues I just talked about around promoting small business development and entrepreneurship. 
Um, so that was great. And, and then um, I attended the, the Portland Suzhou Sister City um, annual gala here at the Chinese Garden uh, last month. Great event. Once again, it's, it's one of our highest profile and deepest sister city relationships. And, um, uh, and since I've been to China a number of times, it's great to, it's great to, uh, to attend that event and, and be able to share some of my experiences uh, with the folks here. And I think everybody knows, hopefully everybody knows that, that, uh, that last week we hosted the MLS All-Star Game. Uh, if, you, if you were around downtown during the week, I, I think this was one of the, one of the uh, proudest moments for the city. It, it was fantastic to see um, all the people about, all the people from out of town who were raving about Portland. We had fantastic weather. Um, it just, you know, could go on and on, and then, and then it was, the game itself was great. So I, I, you know, appreciate all the work that went into that and appreciate the Timbers um, helping bring that to Portland. It's, it was, uh, we were on a global stage, and I think we, we showed very well. As Chair Kelly mentioned, we have kicked off the strategic planning process for PDC. The mayor is leading that process, and he's convened an advisory committee, so that group met, and then that, that group will meet another four or five times throughout the fall. We're, we have outside consultants who are going to do an analysis of our work to date, uh, primarily around our economic development strategy. They'll present those findings, and then the advisory group will, will take those findings and develop a set, set of recommendations for the mayor and for the board for the next PDC strategic plan, which we would anticipate having um, a draft of sometime early in, in 2015. Um, so. We're happy that process has kicked off, and the, the, the group that the mayor's convened is, is a great group. Um, we're also, at the same time, we've convened and have had a few meetings of our URA um, amendment advisory committee. So the, the mayor proposed a series of changes to our urban renewal areas. Um, council said, yes, go forth and study those and, and, and move those along. And so we've convened an advisory committee to give us some feedback on the boundaries and other changes. And so they, that group has met twice already. I think they meet next week again, and then they'll meet one more time and, and deliver a set of recommendations back on boundaries and, and, uh, and other issues for the, uh, it's mainly the central city urban renewal areas that are impacted by, by these changes. <clears throat> I know I'm running long here, but I, I do want to highlight quickly a number of upcoming events. This Friday begins TechFest Northwest. Uh, TechFest is annually is a, is an event which tries to bring together um, and bring people from outside of Portland here to, to, to talk about all things related to our technology sector here in Portland. But, it's, but it does, it, it overlaps with Music Fest Northwest, so it's meant to go beyond kind of the core software and technology industries and talk about the kind of digital, digital uh, media, um, kind of different creative industries, and, um, uh, and explore kind of what's, what's up and coming. We've always been a sponsor of that, and we're sponsoring again. Uh, Friday, Friday evening, we also have the World Sneaker Championships. If you know Dwayne Edwards, he runs Pencil Academy. It's right down the street over here. And he's been hosting this, 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 uh, uh, this group of designers from around the world, and they're, and they're all designing um, interesting athletic uh, footwear, and, and they're going to announce the finalists there. So it's a great way to showcase the work that, that he's doing with, with his, his academy. On Monday, we have the... Grand opening of the Lentz Grown Store Yard. So, if you recall, one of the one of the things that came out of our RFP for our Lentz properties was uh, the use of one of our vacant properties for a public art installation. It's a combination of both kind of physical sculpture type art as well as as well as um, photography, and it's a, it's a, meant to be a kind of storytelling about the Lentz community. So, it's, so that. Art installation is called the Lenskrohn Story Yard, and so there's going to be a, an event Monday night um, with uh, um, live music, food, other other beverages, and uh, and it's being sponsored by or you know managed by Rose CDC, one of our partners in Lens, as well as Propel Studio. So you know I think PDC will have a, a big presence there. A uh, week from Friday, we are sponsoring. Uh, along with the Business Journal, the Better Bricks Award. It's an annual event that honors some of the, the best development projects that have happened over the, over the past year. So um, you can go to the Portland Business Journal's events page to find out about that. Um, what should may be intriguing to you if you're, if you're not interested in, uh, yet is that I, I, I actually get to host the event. So, so you can see me flail up, up there on stage. Um, 
hopefully it's very well scripted. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, something called the J District Night Market begins uh, next weekend as well. Um, so I don't know if you went to the J District in your visits. J District is, is centered at 82nd and Division. And so one way that they're that they're going to try to promote the J District is to begin hosting these these night markets, which, as it sounds, is a is a market that happens in the evening. Um, those are a, a series of Saturdays beginning on the 23rd, and um, um, it sounds really exciting um, um, and, a, and definitely a change from kind of the farmers markets and other markets that happen during the daytime. Um, the Hispanic Chamber holds its annual Hispanic Heritage Celebration. That's on September 4th. That's a Thursday night. Um, uh, Meals on Wheels has their Jambalaya Festival and Barbecue at Dawson Park on Saturday, September 6th. So that's my long list. Before I turn it back over, though, I do want to introduce one new employee. Uh, Will Thier is sitting right here in the front row. That's Will. Will joined us in our real estate team uh, working with Bruce Wood. And uh, um, I always lose track of position titles, but he's a real estate specialist or program specialist or what do we what, so, so your program but sorry sorry about that will but um so we have you know the, the real estate pipeline is definitely full and so we will could not have come at a better time will came to us from rialto capital where um uh it says that he worked to reposition commercial real estate assets that sounds like you were probably working out of some tough real estate assets and um but prior to that will served in the u.s air force for 10 years um he commanded a, a, um, a unit that did search and rescue duties in both Afghanistan and, and, and Africa. Um, so certainly he's more than well qualified to handle the, 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 the drama that happens here. Uh, but, but we really appreciate your service, Will. Will's a graduate of, of PSU real estate program. He's, he's married. He has three children, and I guess two of them just arrived in May. So, uh, so Will's life is really crazy. But I'm sure it's easier than being in Afghanistan. Um, so welcome, Will, and, and uh, maybe it's not. <laughs> you may be really back in active duty. Um, but welcome, Will. We're, we're, uh, we're glad to have you here, and that's all I have. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Patrick. Uh, welcome, Will. Um, you have two uh, meeting minutes to approve. First, the June 4th, uh, 2014 yeah. meeting. Are there any changes? Okay, all those in favor of approving the June 4th minutes? You need a motion. Oh, do, do, did I do that right? I'll move approval, how's that? I'll second the motion, sorry. Yep. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, now the, uh, I'll get this figured out after <laughs> I go along. Um, the June 25th minutes, any changes? I'd move to approve. I was not here, so I would not. Oh, but you can now. Remember, yeah. that was the, the new rule. You don't have to be there, but I'll second. Okay. Motion and a second. All those in favor of the, approving the June 25th, 2014 minutes? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, public comment. I don't seem to have any one who's wanting to make comments. All right. Then we move on to the uh, consent agenda. Can we approve both of those combined? All right. I move approval of the consent agenda. I second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Ayes have it. Thank you. So you're rolling now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, moving on to uh, regular agenda action item number eight, the authorization of a purchase and sale agreement to convey 0.31 acres of real property in the Oregon Convention Center urban renewal area to the Mortensen Development Company for 1,300,000. Good morning, Chair uh, Kelly and the Commissioners. I'm Irene Bowers. I am the Senior Project Manager uh, from the Central city team and I'm here with Bruce Wood who is our real estate manager and I would also like to acknowledge that in the audience is Andy Shaw Metro's chief of staff Hillary Wilton development uh, project manager for the convention hotel and Mike Clifford 
uh, from Mortensen, should you have any questions regarding the convention hotel deal? Um, so. There we go. So we are here today to request your authorization of a purchase and sale agreement of Block 47 in the OCC URA to Mortensen Development Commission for $1.3 million to support moving forward towards a convention hotel. Bruce will describe the terms of the transactions in greater deal, uh, detail later in the presentation. I would like to give you a little bit of background on the OCC URA. <laughs> As a reminder, the OCC URA was formed in uh, 1989 with the number one goal was to recruit at least one headquarters hotel. So 15 <laughs> years later, we're almost there. <laughs> so um, kind of a little bit on the timeline is PDC and Metro for the last 15 years have, has actively been pursuing the development of a convention hotel across the street from the OCC. In the early 2000s, PDC pursued acquisition of properties for a convention center hotel, including Block 47. Between 2004 and 2010, PDC and Metro came very close to building a headquarters hotel, which was on the PDC-owned properties which were east of the convention center. But due to the Great Recession, the project was halted. So in 2014, Metro issued an RFP and Mortensen Development was selected to design and build the hotel. In June, Metro and Mortensen signed a development agreement and a room block agreement. And then as a result, it's anticipated the design team will go to design review in September. Construction will start in September of 2015 and we'll finally have a grand opening in fall of 2017. Uh, just to give you a little context of where Block 47 is, excuse me, is it's on the corner of Holiday, Northeast Holiday and Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. And as you know, the good news is the Lloyd District is getting this resurgence of development activity lately with the Hasselow on 4th project, it's a four uh, block development, and a $50 million upgrade to the Lloyd Mall. Uh, block 47 is a very strategic site for the convention hotel and in the context of the surrounding developments occurring most likely in the plaza of the convention center. Um, block A is currently under construction and it'll be a six story mixed use development with 186 residential units and then the former Red Lion will, be now, will become Hotel Eastland um, with the new owners beginning complete renovation um, in the next few months and that will turn it into a three-star boutique hotel similar to their last project which was the Hotel Modera. So Block 47 is critical to the Convention Center Hotel at the corner of Northeast Holiday and uh, MLK in the terms of urban design and comp complementing the connections between the hotel and the OCC and the rest of the district. Um, at this time, I'd like to turn the rest of the presentation over to Bruce. Thanks, Irene. I'm just going to dis quickly describe the uh, transactional details. Uh, the purchase price is a million three. We'll talk about that further in a moment. Uh, there's a modest amount of earnest money. It's a promissory note. It's converted to cash upon waiver of all the contingencies. Again, this project won't move forward. This parcel won't be sold unless the convention center hotel moves forward, obviously. It's contingent upon closing of the other parcels and then moving forward with the hotel. And then once they have design review <coughs> approval, it'll close then within 60 days. About the price, um, per our policy, we had the appraisal done uh, in June, and it came in at a million six twenty. As per our agreement with Mortensen, they can go get another appraisal, which they did. Uh, their appraisal came back with a value of a million dollars at the end of July. 
Uh, the reason those two were differed is primarily because of the appraisal's opinion on how to treat the super block requirements as well as uh, the use of the comparable sales. One, our appraiser used more market, which was predominantly west side sales. Their appraiser stuck with only comps that they found on the east side. Both of them are, uh, in their opinion, that was the best way to approach it. So we got the two appraisers together. Uh, they had a conversation where they kind of talked with, out with each other and they kind of closed that gap. One was around a million 350, the other one came up, said, that's eh, a million 282. And then uh, we had a conversation with um, our director of, of real estate, Gina Vigellan, and we confirmed it, uh, a negotiated price then with Mortensen, and we all agreed that a million three reflected the appraised value of the property. And that's it. So if we have any questions. Commissioners, any questions? The, the only thing I'd point out is uh, that appraisal process and negotiation process, I think uh, it's important for people to understand, as Irene stated, our number one objective in this urban renewal area was a convention center hotel when it was formed in 1989. And uh, my understanding is this hotel can't be developed at the scale that is needed without that piece of property, and we can't get the hotel without selling that piece of property. So. That negotiation process, I think, is a little unusual for us in that we typically don't see it, but I think it's a very important to understand that that's a normal part of our process. And in my mind, it's a negotiated uh, circumstance. So uh, it's not really a question, but I, that's a long statement to see if you would nod your head to what I'm thinking. <laughs> okay. Mm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I, I'm happy to see it come up. I recall. One of my first board meetings when I uh, joined the commission in 2006 was about the convention center hotel and at that time we transferred it over to Metro. So I'm very excited about the possibility, I'd say the high probability of this actually coming to fruition. So thanks to everyone for all the hard work. Any other questions? No questions. I would just echo commissioners, uh, Commissioner Wilhoit's um, satisfaction and hopefully <laughs> this is finally going to be the one that gets going yeah uh, does anybody want to hear from anyone else do i have a motion I make a motion to approve uh, resolution number seven zero six nine i second the motion we have a motion and a second all those in favor aye aye, aye. ayes have it thank you very much thanks okay. Yeah, and I'd thank everybody, PDC, Metro, the city, everybody that's worked so very hard on this over the last several years. Thanks to everybody. Yep. Never, never give up. <clears throat> yeah. Our uh, next agenda item is uh, Resolution 7070, authorizing purchases and sale agreement to convey quarter acre of real property in the R River District Urban Renewal Area to the Grove Hotel Partners LLC for $630,000. Good morning, Chair Kelly, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Kelly, Commissioners. My name is Eric Jacobson with the Real Estate and Lending Team. Good morning, I'm Lisa Abwaf, Central City Manager with PDC. And we're here today to present a purchase and sale agreement to sell the Grove Hotel property. Um, the action we're asking for you is to approve Resolution 7070, which will authorize the Executive Director to enter into a purchase and sale agreement with our partner, which is Grove Hotel Partners, LLC. <clears throat> that is a limited liability company established by Eagle Point Hotel Partners and NATO Development. The result of this will be to sell the property at fair market value for $630,000. Um, just uh, quickly on this slide, just to show you, this is where the property is located. It's on West Burnside Street in downtown Portland located between Northwest 4th Avenue and 5th Avenue. And this is the location of the property shown by that red star in the context of the Old Town Chinatown neighborhood. Um, it's an, an important location in the neighborhood at the uh, foot of the Chinese gate. And, it, and as you know, um, Old Town Chinatown has been an area of focus for us over the past nine months. And Lisa's here to talk about um, some of that activity and how this project relates to that. 
Thanks, Eric. So a little bit of background in terms of strategic alignment, as Eric mentioned, this is a key gateway. If you go back to the map, clearly 3rd and 4th Avenue are core to the Old Town Chinatown Action Plan um, focus area and the goal of really renovating the building with active use and complementing the, the gateway into Chinatown is key, as well as Eric will go into the fact that the, uh, the transaction is in alignment with PDC's equity and green building um, policy while it is a market rate transaction. So a little bit of background and just update on the Old Town Chinatown Action Plan. As you may recall, the Action Plan was before you about six months ago. It's an integrated strategy to return balance to the neighborhood and strive for an economically vibrant Old Town Chinatown. And there are three key areas of which this clearly falls into. One is around neighborhood investment, both in public and private properties, as well as connectivity through infrastructure improvements. Second was a bit around business vitality. And then third was around district management and district um, livability. This was one of the properties called out as a PDC property for redevelopment um, in the action plan. A brief update on the action plan is we took it to council. Sarah Harpole took it to council. She would be here, but for getting married <laughs> this past weekend. Um, took it to council and it was recently approved by city council. And then we just wanted to give you a brief update on some of the changes that happened between when you saw it last and when it went to council. A couple to call out is one, we did an extensive amount of outreach with the community between last fall um, in this past spring, and based on some of the comments we, re we received from them, we are introducing the community livability grant um, in the Old Town Chinatown area, and they are part of the community livability grant process that we're undertaking with the neighborhood communities as well. And the second item to call out for you is there were some alterations to the SDC waiver exemption pilot program that was proposed when, um, when the action plan came before you. And um, we do, in fact, uh, per council approval, have that as a complementary tool to tax increment financing to generate new development, and in particular, new development of housing that will introduce a balance of income um, units in the neighborhood. So that concludes kind of the background in terms of where we are with the action plan, and we'll hand it back over to Eric for the transaction details. All right, thanks. <clears throat> So just some details on the property itself. It's an 11,000 square foot parcel. Although we often refer to it as the Grove Hotel and think of the iconic sort of building facing on uh, West Burnside Street. It's actually two buildings. Um, there's another building um, that wraps around uh, 4th Avenue that's a one-story building. Total of 27,570 square feet in the two buildings. It was most recently occupied as a 70 room, single room occupancy hotel. Um, it's been vacant since March 2011, subject to a stipulated agreement with the City of Portland that, <clears throat> that the property would not be occupied as a waiver for having to correct code violations in the property. It's a primary contributing resource to the new Jap Chinatown, Japantown Historic District, which means um, as it goes through its um, approval process, it will be reviewed by the Historic Landmarks Commission. And we um, commissioned an appraisal uh, last month, and the appraised value was $595,000. Now, you'll know earlier I said the uh, purchase price was $630,000, which is slightly higher than the appraised value. The $630,000 is the offer that was made by the Eagle Point and NATO development teams, and it's within 5% of the appraised value, which we thought, you know, both of us felt that it was a fair value, and that's the agreed-upon purchase price. A little bit of the property history going back to PD's, PDC's acquisition of it started in 2008. And this was done at the direction of the Portland City Council. It was an agreement between PDC and the Housing Authority of Portland to support um, homeless individuals and at-risk at individuals and to provide continuing service to that community. Uh, title actually transferred to PDC in 2010. As I mentioned, between 2010 and 2011, the occupants of the building were relocated, uh, subject to the stipulated agreement. Um, in 2010, PDC was approached by um, a team led by David Gold, who's an adjacent property owner. That team was um, proposing to develop a youth hostel in the property. They examined that. We entered into a binding development agreement with them, and that a, a development agreement um, was uh, terminated in December of 2012 because the project wasn't financially feasible. In February 2014, you know, following upon the beginning of looking at the Old Town Chinatown Action Plan, we issued a request for proposals for the property. We received 11 submissions, which we were really pleased with. It shows there's a lot of development interest in this 
neighborhood and in this property. Um, those proposals were evaluated by a team that included three members of the neighborhood. And as a result of that, the Eagle Point Hotel Partner and NATO Development Team was selected. In June, we entered into a MO memorandum of understanding with the team that defined some preliminary due diligence steps that each of us would take in leading to a binding purchase and sale agreement. And that's where we are today. In terms of what the team is proposing to develop, it's um, they're proposing a $6.9 million renovation of the property into a lifestyle hotel with 52 rooms with ensuite bathrooms and 107 beds. Now, earlier I mentioned the property was most recently operated as a 70 room, single room occupant hotel. And now you can see they're proposing 52 rooms. And you can see in this upper left hand diagram, just shows some early thoughts about what the team is looking at in terms of combining some of the smaller rooms into bigger rooms. And some of those rooms will have one bed. Some of those rooms might have the ability to accommodate up to four beds. So that's what they mean by a lifestyle hotel. It's sort of a combination of a hotel and a hostel. And they're going to have the flexibility to manage it depending upon the demand and different types uh, of demand during throughout the year. They're also planning to, on the first floor, for a restaurant, coffee shop, other retail spaces, and hopefully uh, planning a roof deck, which would be a, a, big, a good amenity for this property. And if things go according to their current schedule, they'd be opening the building in the middle of 2016. On the right-hand side just shows some of their early thoughts about some of the uh, design concepts for the property. In terms of the purchase and sale agreement terms, as I mentioned, the purchase price is $630,000. There's a 10% earnest money payment due at the end of their 60-day due diligence period. PDC is not providing any direct financial investment into this deal. Uh, the developer is going to renovate the building for the Lifestyle Hotel, um, and they'll commence construction within 24 months of closing. So the key milestones are there'll be a 60-day due diligence period after we execute the purchase and sale agreement. They'll be closing on the property uh, 60 days thereafter. And in the event they don't commence construction within 24 months um, of the closing, PDC will have a repurchase right. So to summarize, we're asking you to approve resolution 7070, which will result in the sale of the property. And if you have any additional questions, we'll take them. <clears throat> Commissioners, questions? really have any questions I, I'm just really happy to see this proposal come forward after a couple of other trials that, that didn't work so this would be a, a really great project to get going and, and uh, reuse a building in, in Old Town that I think send out a really good signal for the neighborhood so thanks for the hard work I feel the same I think this is a really important project it's a good uh, launching project to the, the action plan as well so um, I was excited about the youth hostel when we voted a couple years ago, so um, this seems like a good uh, modification to what that idea and concept was as well. Um, I was curious about the um, selection process, just um, with the 11 proposals, was this probably the best offer in terms of uh, value that we could have received? Well. Um, we received two offers that, in terms of financial terms, were slightly higher. We received uh, one offer for $650,000, and I think the other was $640,000. So this was technically the third highest offer. They were within ten or $20,000 of each other. So technically, it wasn't necessarily the highest. Okay. But in evaluating the proposals as a whole and looking at what the use was going to be, we felt this was the best combination of development okay. team experience and use. One of the, um, Lisa touched on this a little bit, is um, one of the attractive things about the hotel use is that it's going to create activity seven days a week. And some of the other uses that were proposed were, for example, office use. In which we, and we need additional office space. But at this key location at the gateway, um, I think we valued the activity that would be created by hotel use a little bit more than perhaps an office, office use in this location. And the same goes for residential, too. Is I think we did get a residential proposal. Um, I can't remember the exact number of um, apartments that were proposed, but it was, uh, again, we just felt that, um, you know, having uh, a hotel constantly bringing people into the neighborhood would just be a more active use. And I was also very pleased to see that with this market rate transaction, we um, applied our equity and green building policies. 
So thank you for all your hard work on yeah. this project. Yep, I will just uh, second the comments already made. Uh, very happy to see something moving uh, in this area and hope to see it come out of the, uh, it's already out of the ground, but be totally remodeled and opened. Uh, one question I had, uh, the prior project that we did approve that Commissioner Mullis referenced, a 152 bed hostel versus, uh, in this case it was 107, I believe, and the prior project was deemed to, to not be financially feasible. Uh, with more beds, and Eric, you touched on this. Um, can you kind of just explain that a little more deeply, the differences between the two, in case people are watching and saying, well, is this very different than the last one? Why is this one uh, going to work, or why is it going to be feasible? Well, one of the key differences is the team we've selected this time has fairly deep experience with hospitality market. So Eagle Point Hotel Partners is based out of New York. Um, this is something they do on a regular basis. They invest in properties, um, renovate them, and, and upgrade them. Um, secondly, one of their team members is Filament Hospitality out of San Francisco. And again, they have a deep resume of investing in historic properties like this. So that was one of the attractive things. We felt like this team has the operational experience um, that they bring to bear, and they were able to examine sort of and I think they have a more, on a day-to-day -day basis, understanding of the hotel market and how it, how it operates and what to expect financially. Mm -hmm. And I would say when we talk about it being a 52-room, 107-bed ho hotel, that's all subject to change. I mean, they're very early in their design process, so it's going to change, you know, here and there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what they're looking at is, um, you know, the ability to rent the rooms as traditional hotel rooms, if that's what the market demands. And, or, for example, if they have a, a room that has uh, a queen bed and, and, a, and a set of bunk beds, they can rent that to a family as a family room, or they can rent that as individual beds to individuals sharing a group room. So it enables them to sort of adjust the market for different times of the year, mm -hmm. and also to um, you know, see what works best, and they, can, and they can modify it as they go forward. So it's not gonna be a straightforward hostel, uh, sort of what the prior proposal was, and, and so they have a little bit more flexibility. Okay, well, that's that's very helpful. And and the last question I have, the dollar investment for the renovation in this project versus the prior, do, you, do we know how much was planned to be invested in the prior project? Um, off the top of my head, it was in the range of, I think, $4 million. And here so we're looking at over almost close, seven. Close right? to seven. Oh, so okay. this is a much more significant upgrade. Um, they're proposing to invest much more in the property. Okay, well thank you very much. I see that we have uh, representatives from the uh, NATO Development Company. Does do any of the commissioners want to hear from them? Sure. Yeah, they're here. <laughs> if they're here, why not? Yes, you're on. <laughs> We still have an hour left in the meeting, so you've got plenty of time. Yeah, take your time. You didn't want to say that in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair, Commissioners, my name is Bob Nato uh, with Nato Development. I'm Will Nato, uh, with, also with Nato Development. He's also Will Nato, my son, and, uh, and uh, Bill was his grandfather, so it's kind of, I think, appropriate that we're here, and, uh, and in particular with this, with this project. To Commissioner Wilhoyt's point, this is a different project than the one that you saw before, although um, we've talked to David Gold a couple times, and, uh, and that was a really strong team. I mean, uh, Alex Calderwood and the Ace Hotel, um, the restaurant uh, person that they had, uh, the creative strength of John Jay, of John Jay, I mean, that, you know, I think that difference here is that we're using the word hostel and then putting a parentheses around the S, so it's more of a hotel than a hostel. Um, I think the other difference in, in terms of timing is, uh, you know, the hotel market is a lot stronger now than it was, three, you know, two or three years ago. And, um, and finally, uh, I really think Eric's point about our partners is, is, is really uh, something that needs to be emphasized. Um, Ingrid Summerfield, who's with Filament Hospitality, was with Joie de Vivre Hotel, um, uh, Hotels in San Francisco. 
Uh, JDB is probably legendary in the hotel business along the lines of, of Bill Kempton and the Kempton Group. Her first hotel project, their first hotel project, was the Phoenix, which is in the Tenderloin in San Francisco, which, if anything, is a grittier uh, neighborhood and a much larger neighborhood than Old Town Chinatown. And when she flew in here up from San Francisco and, and walked the neighborhood, she had a lot of comments that were uh, hotel operational comments. Um, uh, we, uh, uh, you know, I mean, the elephant in the room is right to dream too. And she saw other issues in the neighborhood that were probably more problematic for hotel guests than right to dream too. Um, and we're prepared to go forward with them there. But, um, you know, we have other uh, more traditional developer issues that we're trying to work through now. We originally proposed 192 beds in this hotel. We're down almost 50% because when we've gone in and started actually with an architect laying out the rooms and trying to put ensuite bathrooms in every, every hotel room, which is a major difference in terms of the economics of, of what we're proposing and why we're more of a hotel. But that chewed up a lot of space. We dropped room count. Now we're finding out physically you can't um, get the number of beds that we wanted to get in initially. So we're addressing that question. We met with the Bureau of Development Services um, and the structural head of the structural engineering department up there to talk about seismic issues with the Grove. It's not a URM building, but it's not an easy building to address, especially the part that's only 30 feet wide and three stories tall. Um, and sheer walls and uh, additional stairs and elevators are gonna eat into that room count again. So we've got a very creative architect, um, architectural firm, uh, Surround Architecture, and Mark Vanderzanden, and KPFF Eng Engineering, and we're kind of working through just the, those issues right now, but I think, um, I think we're going to come up with something that's very creative, and it will be a, uh, a hotel that you know, I keep telling Will, this is not a hotel, well, actually, I keep telling him I don't get it, and he keeps telling me, Dad, this isn't a hotel you'd ever want to stay in anyway, so don't worry about it. <laughs> um, so it's a kind of a generational thing that a lot of, the, a lot of this team at um, Eagle Point is, is Will's generation, not mine, and they really get what that generation wants in terms of a hotel room and in terms of services. I think a couple other comments I'd like to make and then uh, I'd be happy to answer questions. Um, one is the neighborhood and the community support for this project has absolutely been astounding. I mean, the phone, in fact, other proposers on this project were calling me, uh, you know, offering congratulations and, and uh, the neighboring property owners have called to s offer support and uh, that really has, has uh, kind of, I think it raises this profile of just, it's an 11,000 square foot parcel in this little three-story building, but it does have a full block base on Burnside and it's kitty corner from U.S. Bank Tower, so it's a highly visible project and the, and the neighborhood's very excited about it. And the other thing that was uh, really extraordinary to me, and I've been doing this now for a lot of years, are the tenants that have called up wanting to sit down and meet, and we're 18 months out from having anything you know, that they can occupy. But uh, you know, very prominent restaurateurs with very successful, I mean, these are restaurant of the year caliber um, restaurateurs interested in that corner that is across the street from Right to Dream 2, and retailers um, of Will's generation who look at that neighborhood and think um, they have, they want to be in that neighborhood and they want the exposure. So, I mean, that, uh, the fact that we can get a New York developer to come in and partner with us, the fact that the, we got top flight um, retail and, and restaurant people interested in being there is just, um, really extraordinary to me. Thank you. Questions? Um, I was just gonna say, so you do feel like it is actually more of a, of a youth 
hotel. It's a because I one of my questions was what is a lifestyle hotel and and but you know with the combination of uh, upscale restaurant I just I'm trying to visualize I'm in this district so I I actually really appreciate the work and attention that you're putting into it I'm just curious what kind of people are going to be walking on the streets moving in the future well we we describe them in the in the package as um, not necessarily in an age group, but in a more adventurous traveler. Um, okay. And it'll also change during the season. I think there's a lot of business travel. Travel. There are a lot of internet and technology companies now that are in the US Bank Tower. I mean, the, the business journal has been full of stories about ripping out all the traditional TIs and yeah. exposing the structure and, and bringing bicycles and the latest thing is bringing your dog to work. And, it's taken a real kind of adaptation among the Class A office building managers. But um, that's the kind of guest, I think, that we're looking at. But I was in, uh, Will and I were in the Alexis restaurant the other day, and there, there, were, there was an Australian couple in their 60s that were you know, having lunch next, at the next table. We started talking to them, and they're like the target right. customer for this, this hotel. Um, we have a lot of big box hotel rooms in this town, and we have a lot of sort of the traditional hotel rooms. Uh, this will be something, uh, something different, and I think it will. I mean, our partners want to take this concept and take it to other. They're, they're looking for other. We're trying to help find other opportunities in Portland. They'd also like to go to Seattle, and 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 one of them actually actually lives in San Francisco. So it's a concept where um, I won't stay there, okay. but Will will. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Carol? No, I'd just say um, uh, the inertia behind what you're talking about is exciting, and uh, I agree. It's uh, great for the neighborhood, great for the community, and great for the city. So I wish you nothing but the best. I might stay there, so I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> My son will stay there. <laughs> Thanks for sharing the comments and information. That was really helpful. Okay. Thanks Thank for you very much. Thank Good you. work. Appreciate Thank it. You. So it's a very exciting um, project for this area. I would accept the motion. Yep. I move approval. I second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of resolution 7070 signify by saying aye. 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 I have it. Thank you. Um, next uh, agenda item is resolution 7071. I believe Mr. Barnes is going to talk to us about that. Uh, good morning, Chair Kelly, Commissioners, Executive Director Quinton. I'm Tony Barnes, Budget Officer. Uh, this action before you today. Uh, request City Council to issue refunding bonds for the Interstate Corridor 2004 Series A bonds and to execute agreements required to issue, sell, and deliver the bonds. Um, as, uh, as noted in the resolution and the report, uh, to ref this action refinances those bonds. It's about $21 million. That's in remaining principal that was uh, from a bond issue originally issued in 2004. Scheduled to be paid off in 2025. Um, uh, this is a uh, fairly uh, normal action where the city's debt office takes a look at um, outstanding debt and um, where and identifies where there could be favorable terms achieved in refinancing a bond. Uh, the city's debt policy <clears throat> requires financing to achieve at least a 5% total net present value savings. In the analysis of this refinancing, uh, it looks like uh, there's a net present value cash flow savings around 8.8% savings. That's about $1.9 million uh, on a present value uh, basis over the remaining life of the, the uh, bonds. The um, cash flow works out to about $225,000 in savings on a nominal basis over the next uh, 11 years. So that'll add capacity to the district, financial capacity that uh, uh, could be used to achieve the URA's financial goals. Be happy to answer any questions regarding the refinancing. 
That's an easy one, huh? It seems pretty straightforward. <laughs> it saves money. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any, uh, has the city ever had issue uh, reissuing bonds? I know I shouldn't use issue that way twice in the same sentence, but uh, no. never any problem uh, getting those bonds issued. Uh, not, to, not to my knowledge. Um, we've done it um, from time to time over the last uh, few years as the market has been more favorable, as interest rates have dropped. Mm -hmm. And so it's uh, something that uh, they take a look at whenever there's the opportunity to do so. Usually there's a 10-year call period on bonds. Mm -hmm. So when something comes up, yeah. take a look at it and run the numbers. Put it to market, negotiate it. Appreciate the very concise and factual presentation. Yes. Easy to digest. Evening, 1.9. The chair will accept the motion. Did I move approval of resolution 7071? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, thank you. The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Shall we take a uh, short break before we go into executive session? Sure. Yeah. Let's uh, reconvene here in uh, five minutes. Bruce. Bruce.